Good morning. What a day it is. March 24th. It doesn't mean anything to me specifically, but I hope that by the end of this sermon, it'll be a day of reckoning for us all. That by the end of what I'm going to say this morning and at the end of this scripture, that we know without a shadow of doubt who we say Jesus is. If you've been here uh, for the last few weeks or two months or so, uh, Daddy Dr. Steve has been going through the Gospel of John in a series titled, That We Might Believe. And it's a perfect question to ask ourselves, what do we believe? You know, in the day and age that we live in, obviously we all run into the, the fake news and, and all those kinds of things. But we also run into the question of, do you actually believe what you say? Do you believe that Jesus is who he is? Who do you say that Jesus is? In Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 20, it says this, Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Let's pray. Father, as we've gathered together today to honor and bless your name, Father, I pray that you open our eyes that you open our hearts, our spirits, to become more fully aware of who Jesus is and why we believe it. And for those who have never trusted in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you show them that this is the only truth in the world worth holding on to. Father, we love you so much, and we're so glad to be in your presence this morning, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I think it's quite interesting uh, when we look at all the different stuff going on in our world. I just actually got done talking with someone after the first service about all the things we can't believe. Uh, he was telling me about his, uh, his healthy way of living, his healthy lifestyle, and uh, I was trying to track with him a little bit, you know, I, but there's a few things I enjoy that I'm not going to give up. I don't care for the health part. <laughs> But it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, you, you look at our life and we can't even trust the food that we ingest. We can't trust the news because it doesn't matter which side of it you view. If you're on this side, well, that side's wrong and this side says that side's wrong. We live in a day and age where nobody has truth that they hold on to. We live in a day where nobody believes anything full-heartedly. I mean, how many people can you think of in your own head that say something on Monday and do completely opposite of that on Thursday? Or Thursday? I had a girlfriend like that one time. There we go. Y'all heard that joke. There we go. You know, you look at our world and we're all looking for something that we can believe in. Whether it be a marriage, the hopes for your child's future, the hope for your future. We all want something that we can grab a hold of and, and take with us everywhere that we go. And I think it's a perfect way of looking at our world, how Pastor Steve says that we're in a, a crisis of belief right now. What do we believe? This morning we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. I know he's been going through John, so I'll let him have that one. What do we believe? The main question I want you to ask yourself as we go through this sermon this morning is, who do I say that Jesus is? Not what do I think about him, not how does he make me feel, but who do I say he is? Who do I say that Jesus is? 
You know, if you go back and look at the first century A.D., when John's writing these words down, and towards the end of the book, that verse that we've been hearing over the last few weeks is that he wrote these things so that we might believe. It was pretty interesting to go back and do some historical study. Uh, I'm a huge history buff, so it's kind of easy for me. I'll just give you all the cliff notes. When you look at the first century, Jesus is crucified. He goes to the grave. On the third day, he rises. And the Sanhedrin, who was the, not only the religious authority, but also the political authority of Israel and Jerusalem, they go around spreading a lie saying that none of these people had seen Jesus, but that he actually had just had his body stolen and dumped somewhere else. Now, they didn't, they didn't get to be on their like, Facebook or Instagram bullies and just shoot it off. They had to go run around Jerusalem telling people that these men and these women that are proclaiming the resurrection of Christ are lying. You see, our world is not very much different than the world that Jesus lived in. And in the same way that back then people said that this is not the truth, people are going to say it now. And that's why it is so imperative that we today decide who we say Jesus is. Because he was, he is, and he always will be, but it matters for your answer for all of eternity. This has been very much on my mind recently. Those of you that were here last Sunday, you all got to see a piece of my heart as I shared about how my friend had passed away and I was at his funeral. Those people that I know that I've grown up with, I've done all the, all the dirt with, so to speak, I know who they are, they know who I am, but they, don't, they didn't know who Jesus is. You know, I'm sitting there in this funeral home and I'm looking at this hopeless group of people that don't know where to turn for an answer. I can tell you at least half of them were drunk by the time the funeral started because they didn't know how to cope with the pain. They never answered the question of, who do I say that Jesus is? See, at the end of all days, every one of us will go before the judgment seat. And we will have to answer that question, who did you say that I am? As we get into first Coloss or Colossians chapter 1, I want you to think about who do you say that Jesus is? I want you to understand something off, off the bat. It's not about what you say as much as it is about what you do, right? We've been taught that since we were little children. But how much more does it mean right now in a world that everywhere we look there is violence, hardships, heartaches, deaths, genocides, you name it, it's happening. We see it all around us. And if we don't decide today that we say this about Jesus, that he is the end-all, be-all, well, then we're going to watch another generation slowly fall away. We're going to watch our friends pass without ever seeing the glory of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, there was never, I literally, I've been through some terrible things I got one of my siblings here. She can tell you I've done some stuff. There was literally nothing harder than last Saturday, a week ago yesterday. That was by far the hardest thing I think I've ever done. Being in a group of people that I ran around with and I never once showed them who Jesus is. You're saying, well, man, you're getting up and preaching. How are you telling me anything if you've failed at it? And I'm telling you this because I don't want you to fail at it. It took me three nights to finally go to sleep after it. This isn't about me. This is about Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Why do we come to this place? Why are we here this morning? 
I assume that there's probably a few different answers. I know at least one of them was to check off a box for the week. I know for at least a few of us, this is the height of our spiritual week. I know for a few of us that we're not going to open the Bible again until next Sunday. And then when something goes wrong, we're going to ask ourselves, where was this Jesus? Why am I here? Where is he? You see, we have a very clear image of Jesus in this, in this text that we're going to read from this morning. A clear image of the first of all things, the founder of all things. A clear image of the invisible. We must answer the question, who do I say that this Jesus is? Read with me in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Going through verse 20, it says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. It's a pretty good picture of who this Jesus is. You see, and as we read our scriptures, I think the one thing we find as we go through it is we get a lot of that head knowledge. We get a lot of those, you know, I know this is true because I went to church and they told me it, you know, Jesus loves me, the Bible told me so. Yes, the Bible did tell you so. But there's also got to be a reaction to that. There needs to be a, a sense of understanding that it's more than just having the head knowledge. It's got to be something that perpetrates action. You must go out and do something with this knowledge. Or, therefore, or otherwise you're just a song in the wind. The first thing I want, to, want us to kind of look at as we dive in through this scripture is that Jesus is our founder. He is the perfect picture of God the Father. You see, we're always looking for something. We're always out there trying to have something new, something better, a new house, a new car, a new driver, or a golfer. That's a bad joke, see? We're always looking for something to fulfill us, something to look to for, for hope, something to look to in a time of need, something to look to in a time of pain. And all too often, we look to things of this world. You know, if you want to see God, it starts with looking for Him. And this Jesus is the perfect picture of the invisible God. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we look at this and what Jesus, or what Paul is talking to us about here, in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You know, we've been studying the gospel of John, and in, in John chapter 1, 1, 3, it says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. When we look to Jesus and to answer the question of who is this Jesus, we must first understand that He is before all things. 
He is in all things and he is through all things. There is nothing apart from God, apart from the Son, apart from the Spirit. The three in one. It is the complete truth. It's not a truth. It is a complete life. It's not a life. You think about that scripture and it says that he is the way. There's not a secondary one. He is the truth. And I can tell you this, if you talk to anybody in this world, there's so many things that they'll be like, well, I think this is right. Well, I'm here to let you know this morning, I know this is right. Jesus is Lord. And when we look to him and when we look for the Father, we see one and the same. We see the founder of all that we know. We see the reason that we're here gathered this morning. And not only that, but we get to actually see him. You know, one of the reasons a lot of us don't believe whatever that might be is because it's that whole thing. You've got to see it to believe it. My parents went to Missouri this, this week. That's called the show me state. You better show me because I ain't going to believe you until you do. Think about that. That's the world we live in. And I'm, I'm, I want you to see that today you can show people this image. Because if you don't in your world, then no one else will. We must share this image of Jesus. That's why we have to know who he is. We have to know who do I say that he is. That's a question that no one can get out of this life without answering. You must answer the question of either Jesus is who he says he is, or Jesus is just another liar. I forget the little triangle thing. It's either he's a liar, a lunatic, or the truth, something, give or take. But think about this day and age when we're living. People are looking for the answers. You know, a lot of times your friends, your family, they'll come to you because you come to church. I wonder how many of us can testify to this, that we've said the truth and lived the lie. That we told people this is who Jesus is, but then the way we lived made it seem like we didn't even believe it. How many times have we told somewhere, someone where to find this Jesus and completely pushed them away by the way we lived? See, Jesus is the perfect picture of the perfect God, the only true God. We must look to him as the answer. So who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Secondly, looking through verses 17 and 18, it says this, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. See, if we want to know Jesus, I want to be able to answer that question so that all, that come, all the people that come into contact with us also can have that same view of who he is, that, that perfect picture of grace and love and mercy, then we have to understand that in all things, not 80%, not 80 of things, not 85, not 95, not 99 percent of things, but in a hundred percent of everything ever, Jesus has to be first. In order to truly know who he is, so that that knowledge, that saving knowledge of him and his cross can be reported, not just by the words you say, but by the life you live, we must have him as the first thing, always. There's nothing in our life that should come before him. 
you look at this, the scripture is telling us who this Jesus is. And the reason that I'm here to preach this morning is so that you can remember who he is. He is before all things, verse 17. And in him all things hold together. Now I think it's funny how often, this thing's bothering my ear, feeling wondering, I'm not twitching. Now I did my dad's thing, where was I going? Jesus must be first. When we look at our lives, I wonder how many of us can say this. Man, I've been doing right, you know. I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying. I've been going to church. You know, but I still got to have this activity. It still takes precedent. But I'm wondering why things are falling apart on me. You know, I went to church Sunday we sang the songs, it was awesome, I had a great time, I really felt it. And then we go out and live like it never happened, and then we wonder why things aren't working. Read with me again, verse 17. It says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. When we think about who this Jesus is, we need to understand he is the glue that makes the world go round. You'll say, oh, well, I've never trusted him. I've seen things mess up. I've seen bad. Where was he then? The scripture makes it quite clear to us that Jesus is first. And when we change that position of where he is, our life cannot show others who he is. Then we'll get caught up in the, in the downfall of saying, oh, well, you know, I'm, we start blaming God because things are going wrong, but we're not even putting him in his rightful position. We're sitting there saying, nah, he gets first on Sunday mornings. But if it was football season, you know, Sunday afternoons are for the boys. You know, I mean, I, I woke up this morning wanting to play golf. It looks like a beautiful day outside. I'll tell you what, if I didn't think my mom would come home and kill me, I'd go play golf on a Sunday one time. Jesus is first. You see, what happens is this world tries to manipulate us into thinking that he doesn't have to be first. He didn't even have to be second. He could just be there. Because like, man, your truth's your truth. My truth's my truth. You know, peace. But see, the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus is first, whether you claim it or not. His rightful place at the right hand of the throne of God is not dependent upon you. And thank the good Lord it's not. He's already first. And in him, all of this is held together. It's the gravity effect. Somehow this globe of rock and water and lava floating through space, spinning around, and yet it all works together in perfect unity. God is the only one capable of that. There's never been a perfect car built. There's never been the perfect technology thing, whatever these are. Everything fails. We fail. We lose. But Jesus, when he is first in our lives, makes us have the hope of all eternity. Jesus must be first. In Revelation twenty two thirteen, it says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We have to have a clear understanding of who Jesus is and where his place in our lives is at on our priority list. Because I can promise you two things. He's already come and he's coming again. That trumpet will sound and we will all answer. 
to the one sitting on the judgment seat. Who did you say that Jesus is? Was he first? Was he even on your priority list? Because I know that coming through uh, in the week, you know, bills are going to be coming. We're getting to the end of the month, first of the month. You know, there's people going to the hospital. There's people dying. There's news. I mean, goodness gracious, you can't even turn that on without wanting to just cry. In this world, we need to be able to answer who Jesus is. And Jesus is first. Thirdly, this morning, looking through verses 19 and 20, it says this, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. It's quite interesting when you study other religions. Um, one thing you find is that there's never such thing as a truly knowable God, truly knowable deity. A great example of this is Islam, Allah, the unknowable one, loosely translated, my Arabic's not that good, the unknowable one. Half the world's population believes in a God that they cannot know. But look what this scripture says. It says, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in this Jesus. Meaning that the entire character of God the Father is exemplify, exemplified in this Jesus. One of the best examples of that that I can think of is in John chapter 10 with the blind men. You think about this, Jesus goes and he spits into the dirt. I'm just imagining, like, watching the disciples' face right now, like, man, what's this guy doing? He's just spitting in the dirt. And he takes that, that mud clot with the saliva, and he wipes it into the blind man's eyes. And the blind man goes away leaping for joy because he was blind, but now he sees. This is an example of how the fullness of the Creator is wrapped up in Jesus, our Savior. What happened in, in Genesis? How was Adam made? From the dust. And then in this gospel, the, the writer says, I'm writing all this so that you will believe these things to be true because they are. Jesus shows you, I'm still that same God. I'm still the one that makes Adam out of dust. That creates ex nihilo. It's a nice little Latin for you this morning. From nothing. I'm still that same God. Look at another place in John, chapter 4, when he talks to the woman at the well. The complete and utter em, uh, embodiment of the grace of the good Lord. You see, a lot of times we think, oh, like, man, Jesus, you're being kind of harsh, like, telling her to, like, go fetch her husbands, like, and you know she doesn't have one, she's had five. But see, that's not what Jesus is doing. He's not, he's not sitting there trying to make her feel bad. He's saying, I know you. Bring it here. Come home. That's the embodiment of grace. Something you can never earn, given to you freely, simply because he loves you. Or you look at mercy. Think about it in another place in John, when he goes to the temple to cleanse it of the, of the money changers and the people selling uh, the animal sacrifices. You're talking about God Almighty inside the temple, the house of prayer. And yeah, he flips the tables, but he doesn't, he doesn't hate them. He hates the sin that they're committing, and he says, come to me because I'll give you mercy when you don't deserve it. You've taken my father's house of peace and prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. But come to me. It's the embodiment of mercy. Jesus is completely and fully God. His character revealed to us. Emmanuel, God with us. We must be able to answer the question, who do I say that this Jesus is? 
This world is full of lie after lie after lie. You know, for me, I mean, I tell myself a lie all the time. I'm going to break 80 this year. I'm not. I don't practice enough. I don't try hard enough at it. But some cold, hard truth this morning is that many of us say, well, I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus, and then we don't ever even try. We don't believe in the fullness of who he is. We believe that if they want to come, then they'll come, you know. I even invited my neighbor to church last week. And I was talking with my nana, and uh, she's a little firecracker. 84 years old of uh, nothing but fight left in her. Uh, don't ever get on her bad side, I can tell you that much. I in there talking with her about life, love, the lack thereof, you know, I'm just... There's a boy with her grand with his with his grandma, and she was saying, Christopher, you know, you can go through this life and always be really good at talking. And uh, any of you that know me, I'm pretty I'm pretty daggone good at talking. I'll talk to, I'll talk till it's sun up, you know. And she said, You can always be good at talking. You can always be good at telling someone the truth, but until you start living it out on a daily basis, they'll never hear a word you said. You see, we today must answer the question of who do I say Jesus is? Is he the fullness of God or not? Is he the Son of Man, the Son of God or not? Is he Lord, is he Savior, or is he nothing? That question must be answered because this world is in dire need. I mean, how many, how many places of worship have been attacked in the last year? How many things have gone wrong in our world in the last three months? How many people have you seen or know of or had a friend that knew them that somehow you're kind of connected that have passed away in the last year? You see, there's always something happening. There's always something that needs to be done. And that thing that needs to be done is we need to know who this Jesus is. Not some far-fetched fantasy of a genie in a bottle, but the power of God Almighty that raises death into life. That is who this Jesus is. He is the conqueror of the grave. He is the healer of the sick. We must know who he is. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6, it says this. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Meaning, I will not go through this life without letting everybody know who I say Jesus is. He continues and says this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We've been given the light of the world. We can see the image of the invisible God by looking to Jesus. Not by just listening to words on a Sunday morning, not just by going to a Bible study, but actually going in head first and wanting to know the answer to the question of who do I say that he is. This world is in dire need of that question being answered. 
This world has things that combat that all the time, whether it be we live in a day of science, or we live in a day where we have all the answers medically. Who needs God? Who needs this Jesus? I can tell you this, that at the end of your life, at the end of anybody's life you know, they'll be asking that question of, where did I go wrong? Or man, I am looking forward to what's to come. When we look at who Jesus is, one of the best scriptures that I find in thinking about it comes from Hebrews. It talks about, the writer of the Hebrews talks about Jesus being our high priest. Being the one that we can go to to get to the Father, to have our sins forgiven, to have our dead lives become risen lives, to go from a worthless life to an abundant life, to go from hopeless to having all the hope that you can even handle. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So ask yourself this question. Who is this Jesus? Who in your life needs to hear the truth about this Jesus? And who do you say that he is? I say that he is king. King of kings. I say he is Lord of lords. I say that he is the savior of all humanity. I say that he is the embodiment of God in flesh. I say that he is the one that carries our sins away. I say that he is the one that came to give us life, to give us healing, to conquer the grave, to conquer anything that goes against us. He is the one and only, the truth. He is the way. He is the life. Who is this Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, as we've looked into your word this morning, as we've thought about the question of who is this Jesus? Who is this Son of Man, Son of God? Father, open our hearts, open our minds to see you truly today. To know that Jesus is the one who's always been. To know that he is the perfect image of the perfect God. To know that he is the complete fullness of your character, Father. Lord, I pray for the lost souls that may be in attendance with us today, and I pray that you urge these folks out into the streets today, that you light a fire underneath us so that we remember the eternal fire and we tell someone about Jesus today. God, it is in the powerful, almighty name of Christ we pray. Amen.